Hello, my name's Neil. Welcome back to the channel and welcome to the fourth part in our series Starting Bushcraft. In this video, we're going to look at water. How to carry it, how to find it, how to make it safe to drink. Rule of threes tells us human body can go three minutes without oxygen, three days without water, and three weeks without food. So water comes pretty high on our list of priorities. That said, we don't tend to see a massive amount about water and how to procure it on the internet. It's not particularly sexy. Knives, sexy. Axes, very sexy. Fire, even sexier. But water, frankly, it's not all that sexy, but it is vital for life. If we're just out for the day, then carrying a couple of water bottles isn't any great shakes. A litre of water weighs in at about a kilo, so you're just adding a couple of kilos to your pack. But if you're out for several days, that means adding more and more weight to your pack. And physically, we can't carry all of the water we need for a multi-day trip. So we get our map out and we plan where we can gather our water. Now, if we're in one location, if we're away for a bushcraft weekend with a group of friends at a campsite, they should have running water, so it's not too much of an issue. If not, then we're gonna to need to plan our trip so that we can mark up where we are gonna collect our water along the way. Now, if you're in a, a fixed location, like that campsite, then it's not too much of a problem. You have a, a big jerry can of water and you can have that in your camp and that will hold, say, 20 litres, which will be enough for your weekend. But if we're on the move, then we need to have water bottles that we can carry on us, that will hold our water securely, and also have a system in place to help us gather water safely. I tend to go for something like this one litre fairly solid fairly durable military water bottle and these are fairly cheap to get hold of they're robust they last for a good amount of time you can get commercial ones as well this one's a stainless steel one has a nice wide mouth on it so it's easy to drink out of it's also very easy to fill and being made from stainless steel i can also use it for boiling water too it's a little bit on the heavy side but it's very, very durable. If I'm watching the weight and I want to go for something lighter, I go for one of these. Canteen style, made by Nalgeen, made of clear plastic so I can see how much water is in it. Very durable, and as I said, very, very lightweight. Now what I normally carry while I'm out is two of these. So I'm carrying two litres of water. If the weather's really warm, I might carry three, but normally two suffice. To back that up, when I get to camp, I have one of these. Uh, and this is a, an Autolib three litre water bag. And when I get to camp, I fill this up and that gives me plenty of water for all my washing and cooking needs. So the eager... So the eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed I've got one water bottle that's plain and one that's marked up with red stripes. The reason I've got that is when I'm out in the field and I'm gathering my own water, I'd like to know which water bottle has got untreated water in and which one has got treated water in. What I don't want to do is drink untreated water. So by having one that's marked up, I know that this one is yet to be treated. I've used this one for collecting water. The water's in it, but it hasn't been treated. This one has been treated and it's safe to drink. It's good to have a system in place that stops you from mixing the two up because the last thing you want to do is drink untreated water and suddenly find yourself with a big, big problem. One of the biggest killers in the world is bad water because lots of nasty things grow in water and live in water that are gonna make you very poorly. So by having one bottle that's marked up like this, it will remind you, red means danger. 
Don't want to drink untreated water. So, the, so once we move away from the fixed campsite and we start gathering water for ourselves, then we have to think very carefully about how we do it. The last thing we want to do is make ourselves ill or ruin that trip because we've taken on board bad water in some way. What I do is I have three basic areas that I look at when I'm collecting water on the trail. Number one, location. Is the location that I'm looking to collect water in, A, safe? A good way to tell that is by having a look on a map of the area. Look to see what potential hazards there are. Are there farmers fields where they may have sprayed insecticides or chemicals? Are there industrial areas that the water may have flown through, uh, flowed through where it could have become contaminated? Has it flowed through large areas of human habitation? In which case, again, it could be polluted. Is it near a, a large road? Because heavy metals come off that road, and again, that could get into your water supply and make you poorly. All that information will be on your map, so have a good study of your map. Look for places like springs, streams, rivers, and check them over to see if that location is safe. Even if I'm up in the mountains, then what I tend to do is I choose my water collection point, but I will walk further upstream for a few hundred meters just to make sure there's nothing dead, perhaps dead livestock, um, in the stream that could contaminate my water. The other thing with location is being able to actually locate your water in a landscape. Get used to looking at a landscape working out where the low points are and looking to see where the potential sites for water are. Quite often just down below the tops of hills if you look on your map uh, you'll see the start of, of streams and stuff flowing off and above that you'll find areas where the, the ground is well sodden and quite often there are springs in those areas. So it's worth checking out your map but also getting used to looking for water in a landscape. My second rule is filtration. Always make sure that you filter your water in some way. Now, what I tend to use is one of these. This is old technology, this is something called a Millbank bag and they were issued to British forces for many, many years. And what they do is they remove the sediment. All we do is soak the bag in water, the fibers in the cotton expand, which makes it very stiff, but what it also makes is it makes it very difficult for anything other than water to flow through. That will remove all your sediment. So those little tiny things that make the water cloudy come out. It will even remove some of the smaller insects and parasites from your water. Word of caution with these, make sure it's well soaked when you use it. Hang it up in a tree or from whatever point you can pour the water in and the water will start to flow after a few minutes but wait until it passes this line at that point we know that the filtering process is well underway and that's when we put it our bottle underneath it to start gathering water it's a good bit of kit it removes the sediment but as yet it's not actually made the water completely safe to drink for that we need to look at our third rule and that is purification. So there are lots of different ways to purify water. We can add chemicals to it. Over in the States I know they tend to use tincture of iodine. Um, we tend not to use it so much over here in the UK. Instead chemical treatment we tend to go for these and these are puri tabs and they're a little chlorine tablet they make your water taste like a swimming pool but they do kill off the nasties in it they've got instructions on each pack uh, and what it says on there is you put one of these into one litre of water you then allow it 
30 minutes contact time. Little word of caution, if it's colder, the contact time needs to be longer. And what I tend to do is the weather's cold, I leave it for about an hour. That way I know that everything that's in there that could do me any harm has been hopefully killed off. Another little top tip with our, our water and our chemicals. Here you have six tablets, enough to treat six litres of water, six of these. Now, I've worked with lots of serving and ex-soldiers from the British military over the years and they always give you lots of top tips. And one I discovered a while ago is on the front of your water bottle at the top here, under a bit of duct tape, you tape six, one of these packs containing six tablets you've always got enough tablets to purify six litres of water if all else goes wrong. Also nowadays our purification can be done by one of these and this is a filter but it's an incredibly fine filter. Our mill bank bag gets most of the stuff out but it won't get out the bacteria and the pathogens and the things that are going to make you really sick. One of these will. It's an incredibly fine filter. This one's a lifesaver. This is one of the older models that used to be issued to British Armed Forces back in uh, Afghanistan. Simple to use. Once you've located your water supply, you scoop the water up into here you put the top on, screw it down, pump it vigorously and what that does is that builds up pressure inside. It then forces the water through a series of filters. What you can then do, pop the cap on the top, lift up the drinking spout and drink it straight out. The other thing that you can do is you can use this for filling water bottles. You just pump the water straight through into your water bottle. This one's quite a bulky one. Lifesaver do a more compact one nowadays called the Liberty, uh, which is a really, really good piece of kit and well worth the money. So your basic Lifesaver filter good. Another excellent piece of kit is one of these. This is the Sawyer mini filter. It's a bit of a multi-purpose filter again. Inside here are some very very fine filters that will take out pretty much everything. I think on the back it says 99.999 <coughs> uh, removal of, of all nasty. So your bacteria, pathogens etc. The way it works as you fill this bag from your water source. With that done, we then screw the filter onto it, making sure that the arrow is pointing that way towards the spout. What we then do is roll the bag up, squeeze the bag, and you can drink direct from the spout. You can also squirt it into your water bottle so you can use this for filling water bottles. This will also fit into the feed line on a hydration system. So these are a, a good piece of kit that uh, are lightweight to carry and relatively cheap to buy. So my last method of purification is heat. Bring it to the boil. Bring it to 100 degrees, a good rolling boil, and that will kill off any bacterial pathogens in the water. Most of those are killed at 86 degrees, so by raising the temperature to 100, it makes it safe to drink. Obviously, I collect it in my collection bottle. I'll then put it through my mill bank bag, direct into my pan, and then get the pan over the fire, bring it to the boil, then allow it to cool. That's then safe to go into one of my safe water bowls. As I said, this has kept me safe for many, many years.
So I'm out in the woods and I haven't got any of my usual gear. What I need to do is source myself some safe drinking water. Now I'm gonna walk up here, found myself a stick, and I've also found myself a couple of thrown away plastic bottles. With this and a little bit of knowledge, I should be able to get myself some safe drinking water. The wood that I mean is on top of a hill, so I know that there are no sites that contaminate my water uh, above my current location. There's no agricultural fields, there are no industrial sites. So what I'm going to do now is make my way down into the lower ground in the woods and see if I can find some sort of water source. And here's what I'm looking for, an area of saturated ground at the top of a gully. What I'm going to do now is follow the gully down, see if I can find somewhere where the water's running a little bit clearer, I can actually start to collect some water. So I found this little spot where the water is running a bit clearer. It's not terribly deep, so what I need to do is create a small pool that will make it easier for me to collect water with my plastic bottles. What I've done is I've created a, a cone shaped hole. Water is a bit cloudy at the moment but give it a few minutes and it will start to run through clear again. So that's my water collected. What I now need to do is filter some of the sediment out of this. So with my water collected, what I now need to do is put it through some sort of filter. It's a bit cloudy at the moment, and that tells me that there's particulate matter in there, very little bits of um, mud from the gully that it came from. So what I'm gonna do is filter this out. What I'm gonna use to do that is my Mini Moore survival scarf. Now parachute nylon has got a very, very fine weave. And if we double it, and then double it again, that gives me four layers of fabric that it will have to pass through. And that should, hopefully, remove most of the particulate matter from this water. So here's my filter. I've got my water bottle ready. I'm going to pour it into the pocket that I've created so it will filter through the four layers of fabric. Now it takes a, a few seconds for the fabric to wet out, which should give me enough time to transfer the bottle from the top to sit it underneath to start collecting the water. Here it goes, it'll start to slowly, slowly drip through. And there it is. A little bottle of stream water filtered through my survival scarf. Obviously, that's just the filter stage. I still need to make it safe to drink because although that will remove the particulate matter, it might not remove the nasties, the bacteria, the pathogens, etc. So my next stage 
is to put this through some heat and see if we can get it to a stage where it's safe to drink. So I've got myself my fire going, but at the moment I've got a little bit too much flame. What I want is to let this die down a bit so that I've got less flame and more embers. So the fire's died down, but there's still a good bit of heat. Now what I'm going to do next is clear back some of these embers so I can stand the bottle semi into the fire. Now this relies on two things. Number one, removing the cap. And number two, making sure the bottle is filled all the way to the top. Now the heat that's coming off that fire, I can just about hold my hand over. What I'm going to do now is build the fire up around the bottle and gradually it will start to heat the water. And what I'm looking for are going to be signs that the water is heating, so I'm going to be looking for bubbles forming inside the bottle. So this relies on the principle that radiated heat is gradually going to heat the water up in the bottle. As long as the bottle is filled, the plastic, although it might disfigure, won't burn or completely melt. So I've just got to keep my eye on it. Where I've got a little gap in the top, the top of the bottle will disfigure. The bottle may disfigure and could fall over, but as long as you keep an eye on it, then all should be okay and eventually our water will come to a temperature that will make it safe to drink. Now most bacteria and pathogens are killed at about 86 degrees so as long as I can raise it above there so that I've got good expansion and a little bit of a boil then this water should be safe to drink. The actual time that you leave it as well is quite important. Don't allow it to just come to the, to the expansion point leave it there for several minutes as long as you can so all of the water is getting that continual heat all the way through so you can see now the bottle has disfigured a little bit but the water is expanding we're getting bubbles forming inside and bubbles coming out of the top so that water is getting pretty hot and it's probably taken about six or seven minutes I'm going to leave it on there for a little bit longer until the flames have died down and all of that extra time well that's all good because that's all going to help kill any bacteria or pathogens that are present in the water um, because of that longer exposure to the heat So there it is. That's had about 25 minutes now. Water's expanding, it's been bubbling away, steaming away, and I'm pretty happy that after exposure to that amount of heat for that amount of time, anything that's in this water that could do me any harm is now completely destroyed, and this water is safe to drink. What I'm going to do now is allow it to cool down. I can put the cap back on the bottle if the top's not distorted too much and this water is good to go. So here's my bottle of water. It's cooled down now. Now technically, this hasn't boiled, but it was raised to a point fairly close to boiling point, and it was left for 25 minutes. So this water isn't sterilized, it's pasteurized in the same way they do with milk. Because of that contact time, 
I'm pretty sure that everything in there has been killed off, certainly anything that's going to do me any harm. So let's give it a go. Absolutely fine. Obviously these bottles aren't designed for heating water in and long term probably doing this wouldn't do you a lot of good because various chemicals etc will come off the plastic and leach into the water. But in an emergency situation rather than die through dehydration or risk getting something nasty from in the water I think I'd probably go with this option. So there you go, there's my quick guide on what is a very expansive subject. Hopefully though, it's given you enough information to keep you safe if you have to actually go out and collect water for yourself. As always, I hope you've enjoyed this video and I hope you found it useful. If you have, then please share it. If you haven't already, hit the like button. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. As always, you can get in touch with me via email. My email address will come up on the screen in a moment. You can also follow me on Instagram. I'm greencraft01. And if you want to show your support for the channel, then scoot over to my Etsy shop, it's Greencraft Shop, and look up some of the items I sell. Now, one of the items of these, the Greencraft patch, show your support for the channel. Get a patch, sew it on your smock, or your, or your rucksack uh, and uh, let other people see it. Also on the shop you might find some of my Mini Moors survival scarves which as you're starting to see from these videos they really are a multi-purpose piece of survival equipment. I've been Neil and until next time stay safe.